Car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Hello and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the show. This show is all about you, education and information when it comes to the law. Now, some neat things that the firm of Hollis Wright makes available this evening, an opportunity for you to contribute. You'll see ways all throughout the program where you can be a part of our conversation. So if a question pops into your mind, you can get in touch with us there. Also, attorneys will be standing by for the next half hour and they are standing by to speak with you. So if you have a question and need some free legal advice, would like to speak with an attorney live that opportunity available at the number you see at the bottom of your screen all throughout the program this evening leading our conversation from the firm of hollis wright managing partner josh wright good to see you sir you too hope you had a great week another I, good week i did thank you good you know we um uh, we do all sorts of shows um throughout the year and um uh, several times a year we do shows related to criminal law mm -hmm. uh, dui and different spins on those shows and tonight uh, we've got a great guest, uh, John Lentine, um, who's going to be doing um, uh, this show with us and kind of going to be our expert uh, in this area of criminal law and DUI uh, with Sheffield and Lentine. Um, just first of all, thank you for being on the show. We really, really appreciate it. Well, Josh, thanks for having me. David, I appreciate getting a chance to be here. And I know it's been a long time, but it way is. back in the day, yes. you were also on the show and uh, did a little different spin probably on this topic. I did. It's okay. been a while, okay. but uh, it's good to be back. I'm not going to make you have to memorize what you did back then. How about that? <laughs> good. Right, good. I appreciate that. Um, all right. So talk to us just a little bit about uh, your practice. Um, how did you get into this area of the law? Because as you and I both know, this really is a specialty. You don't just dabble in criminal law and DUI. You know, I think for a lot of criminal defense lawyers, it's a calling more than anything else. And it was something I always wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do it when I was in law school. And that was 30 years ago last week. Congratulations. So, thank you. So it's been 30 years doing nothing but criminal defense work. I have a small firm. Uh, my partner, Wendell Sheffield, we have one associate and another one on coming in. And we do primarily criminal defense work, uh, both in municipal courts, state courts, and federal courts, and along with some other work too, some domestic and some personal injury, but mostly criminal defense work. Do you see a lot of times that um, you're coming in and being asked to come in in cases to clean the mess up because somebody tried to go it alone initially when if they had just gotten with a lawyer early, it may have helped the result? Absolutely. That So many times people think that that they can take care of the situation themselves, that they don't need an attorney. I think anytime you have any kind of legal situation, to try to do it yourself is a recipe for disaster. So, Can I ask a question to the both of you? Because on that topic, it, if you, uh, it seems to be through the legal TV shows, there's a ton of them, and, and, and folks are so devoted to those shows. Yeah. I think it's, it's almost like we kind of feel like we know the law. Yeah. And then you see ads all the time about easier ways to do this, no need to call the attorney, you know, an online form. Has that complicated it for, for the, the, the practice uh, of being an attorney? Yeah, we can both go. You hit it first. Sure. I, I think they're the worst things in the world is watching. I, I won't watch any legal shows to tell all my friends don't watch them because they're make-believe. Right. And sometimes they try to spin in legal concepts in ways that really don't play out in the real world. So I think they can be a detriment if people say, well, they did that on the TV show I watched yesterday, yeah. so I can handle that. And that's a huge mistake, and it does a really disservice to people if they think that that, that's, that they can handle situations like that for themselves. What yeah. I love about those shows, and you and I have talked about this off camera before, is there's always an aha moment in every mm -hmm. one of those shows. Big reveal. Some lawyer outduped the other lawyer, yeah. and you know, I, this lawyer didn't know this was coming into trial or didn't know this was going to come into the investigation. The reality in the real world is that doesn't generally happen. If you've got competent counsel, um, you're doing the work that is necessary so that when you get to trial uh, or you're completing that investigation, you know each and every fact about that case. Mm -hmm. He who knows the facts of the case really controls the lawsuit. And so, you know, a lot of times there's these aha moments in those shows, uh, and that's not the reality of right. the real world. But I, I will say this they're good entertainment, and it's fun to watch those <laughs> things. Um, but it also portrays lawyers a lot of times as 
um, uh, having a value greater than what lawyers do, where people think that lawyers are not accessible. One of the things that we started with this television show was the concept of access to justice, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was one of our focuses, is to help people understand they can have access to a lawyer, right. whether it's calling a criminal lawyer that you think may be expensive, where John will sit and talk and walk you through and lead, guide, and direct you through the process, where you realize, oh, okay, hold on, I can afford this. Mm -hmm. And I needed him on the front end, why didn't I get him involved? Right. So part of it is, you know, it's good entertainment and it shows access to justice in a little bit a different way than I wish it would. Um, the, the pe people have access to be able to right. get to lawyers like John and, and, and our law firm, yeah. and so uh, that's why we, we do the show in the process. Uh, let, let, let's talk for a minute about criminal law. Explain to somebody who has not been involved in a criminal deal before uh, kind of what the process is from arrest forward, and I know this just kind of is, we'll go through these things in dif uh, detail, and this may just kind of be the cliff sure. notes, but kind of from start to finish how this works. Sure. I mean, first of all, the difference between what you do and I do is that in civil law, you're dealing with personal disputes many times between individuals mm -hmm. or between a corporation or something of that nature where they have an individual has been wronged in some way. In what I do, the state or the government prosecutes somebody for acts that are deemed harmful to society or for the protection of society. So. The system usually starts, it's, it's a reactive system. An individual is arrested. Uh, that's done by a police officer who has what's called probable cause to believe that person committed a crime. They can arrest somebody on their own initiative, something that they see them do so something that's illegal, or that they gather enough information to go out and get an arrest warrant and arrest that individual. The process begins after the arrest. A person is processed, depending on where they are in the state, federal, or municipal courts. They're processed through, uh, after being arrested, booked. Uh, they get biographical information, and then they determine whether or not they're eligible for release on bond. If they bond out of jail, then the process begins. In my system, usually in what I do, in the state level, we start at the district court level, where a person goes to an initial appearance, where they're formally told what the charge is against them, whether they have a right to counsel. Then they go through a preliminary hearing, and then the case, if it moves forward, goes to a grand jury. If a grand jury indicts, then the individual goes to trial. And you know, a lot of people, David, don't realize that the criminal process, uh, there are a, a bunch of steps that get you to the time when you're, um, you've got a lawyer for trial purposes, but you need a lawyer early on in that process to mm -hmm. make sure that you do the right things, That's say it. the right things, and don't say the wrong things um, through the process. Absolutely. A question that we have got, if I'm charged with a crime in Alabama, is there a way to get that off my record? Expungement. Um, okay. Expungement's a, a relatively new concept that passed by the legislature several years ago. And there are ways of having an arrest expunged or taken off your record, but that's going to depend on a variety of things. One, how that arrest was resolved. And specifically, it, the case either has to be dismissed, or preferably dismissed with what's called prejudice, a grand jury has to either no bill it or say there wasn't sufficient evidence to indict you, or you have to be acquitted at trial, or you have had to have the case dismissed by going through some sort of a deferred prosecution program. If you're, uh, one of those things happened, then you can petition with the circuit court within the jurisdiction of where the arrest happened and request that that arrest be expunged. Um, the thing to remember, though, is if you've been convicted of anything, you cannot have it expunged. But, right. And there are 51 different charges that can never be expunged regardless if the case was dismissed, mm. you were acquitted at mm. trial or whatever. So you're going to need a lawyer if you want to walk through Absolutely. that process. I know we're getting ready to go to break. Mm -hmm. When we come back, David, I do want to talk about um, the difference between felonies and misdemeanors, how sometimes crimes are pled down, and the impact it's going to have if you are convicted and you don't have a lawyer. Uh, if you are convicted on your employment, because uh, okay. it can have a, a significant impact on uh, your place of employment. All right, we'll pick up right there whenever we get back. Also, when we come back, how you can get two tickets to the toughest ticket to get in the state of Alabama every year. Uh, the kind of ticket that you want to get, not one that you don't want to get. You're, you're going to want these, these tickets. Details on that coming up right after the break.
I'm Josh Wright with the law firm Apollos Wright, a personal injury law firm. Thank you for watching The Attorneys. Now we hope you, a friend or a loved one, never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury related topics, you can call, email, or text us. Or you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or simply contact us by going to hollis rightcom and click on the Contact Us link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us watching The Attorneys. Welcome back into the attorneys. A reminder, attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by right now to speak with you, standing by live. So if you would like to speak with an actual attorney from the firm, pick up the phone and give them a call. Hey, as we uh, come back, to, um, we did a, a contest a few weeks ago, just overwhelming success. A like and share uh, contest, gave away a couple of iPads. Mm -hmm overwhelming the response to that uh, that program so so you guys in that campaign so you guys uh, have uh, generously have a new like and share campaign that, that I think folks are going to be fired up about yeah we're, we're super excited about this I you know I, I do think um, the iPad giveaway was very successful I mean the goal of the giveaway was a thank you to those loyal folks that mm -hmm. watched the show but was also um, to uh, try and increase our footprint, if you can, through social media. We do a lot through social media to help people that are in the viewing audience mm -hmm. to be able to learn information about the law, about things they can do um, to uh, help themselves in, in their regular, right. ordinary um, uh, days. And so we wanted to increase the footprint of our social media. So the iPad giveaway was great. It's a like and share concept, and we gave some iPads away. Now we're going to give away... Um, four tickets to the Auburn Alabama game, two sets of uh, tickets two, yeah. um, to two uh, different individuals. And um, all they have to do is come to our Facebook page. Right. Uh, they need to uh, like uh, mm -hmm. the Hollis Wright Facebook page and then share the post um, related the, to the contest. Yeah, that talks about the mm -hmm. contest, and you'll Sorry. see it there um, uh, about the tickets to the Alabama Auburn game. To, again, um, four tickets, so two sets of two is yep. what's going to be given away. Uh, like and share is all you got to do. So just search the term Hollis Wright, and you'll find it. And I think we're doing that for the next six weeks or so. We are. So uh, register now. Yeah. Right. Get you on. Register. Yeah, I absolutely. I'm already. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I, like I don't that. think I can win. <laughs> 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 all right. Um, as we come back, let's continue our conversation with John. All right. So when we went out to break, I did want to talk. John John, just for a moment about the difference in felonies and misdemeanors and kind of the impact that that can have on your your employment because I know that not having a lawyer and having a felony and pleading to a felony can have devastating consequences on your future in the world of uh, employment. It can. Um, the basic difference between misdemeanors and felonies is time, how much time you can get. Uh, Alabama breaks every felony and misdemeanor into different classes. Uh, misdemeanors go from A, B to C. Uh, felonies go from A, B, C to D. But the major thing to remember is with a misdemeanor, we're talking offenses that have a punishment range of less than, a, well, a year or less. Felonies, a year and a day or more. And the higher the classification, the grade, like an A, the higher class of a felony or misdemeanor it is. But regardless of whether it's a felony or misdemeanor, any kind of offense on your record that you're convicted of or plead guilty to can have ramifications for the rest of your life for employment purposes and otherwise. Felonies worse because felonies can lead you to deprivation of um, well, loss of your right to vote, uh, potentially under the federal law, loss of your ability to ever possess a firearm, uh, loss to get certain loans or certain educational grants or loss by having felony convictions. The collateral consequences to felonies, I think there was a study done and it said there across the country there are over 50,000 different collateral consequences overall in every state for a felony conviction. Are there times when somebody is arrested and charged or indicted with a felony and you're able to come in and plead that down to a misdemeanor? Yes, I mean just because you're charged with a felony offense does not necessarily mean you're going to be ended up convicted okay. of 
a felony offense or plead guilty to it. The thing about having a, a good lawyer working for you is that lawyer is trying to find the best possible resolution that does not lead to you having serious ramifications for the rest of your life based on a conviction. So yes, I mean, if a felony can be worked out for a misdemeanor or for a deferred prosecution where the case is ultimately dismissed, then that's a huge benefit to anyone in their, for the rest of their life. A question we have here, um, when an individual is approached by a police officer, are they required to answer the questions posed by the officer and, and kind of a, a part two here, what if the officer asks for consent to search my car or house? All right, do you want the legal answer or do you want the <laughs> real answer? The legal answer is there's, there's a statute under Alabama law that says if a police officer believes or has reasonable cause to believe that you're doing something illegal that he or she may ask your name and address. But that isn't the same thing as somebody just a police officer coming up and just putting their hands on you and saying, give me your name, give me your identification. Right. That's the legal response to it. If a police officer comes and, and begins to question you, the first thing you should ask is, are you being detained for any reason? Because if you're not, then you don't have to, a responsibility to follow directions that are unreasonable or are not legal. Um, I, I always think that if, if that there's a difference between being cooperative as best you can and not being uncooperative, but mm -hmm. in the same vein, you're not responsible for having to res respond to a police officer's questions all the time for any other reason. We, we need to step aside. Miranda afterwards. Miranda I want to talk about that. We get calls all the time on these shows. I wasn't read my Miranda rights. I'm supposed to get off, and it just doesn't work that way. And I, we're going to talk about that when we get back. All right. We'll do that as we head to break. A couple of reminders. If you want to be a part of that contest, all you have to do, search the term Hollis Wright. You'll find us there on Facebook. A lot of uh, social media activity by the firm to inform and educate you. So a great resource. Check us out on social media. We're coming right back. I'm Carter Clay with the law firm of Hollis Wright. When you serve on a jury, you might expect to have all of the evidence presented to you during the course of a case. But there are some forms of evidence that are not allowed in court. In tonight's Legal 411, we are answering the question, why can't jurors see police incident reports? Most jurors would like to see crash reports during a trial, especially since these documents almost always show the investigating officer's opinion on who was at fault for the crash. Unfortunately, Alabama law prohibits the introduction of such reports into evidence. Alabama law states that no such accident report shall be used as evidence in any trial, civil or criminal, arising out of an accident. According to lawmakers who wrote and approved this rule, the reason accident reports cannot be admitted as evidence is that a jury might place too much weight on an official document such as a police report. There are some exceptions to this rule, of course, but most courts generally won't allow this type of evidence to be shown to a jury. Despite this rule, police officers who investigate crashes are still allowed to testify. They can tell a jury what they saw at the scene of the crash, including the road conditions and the positions of automobiles. An officer can also inform a jury of most any statement the people involved in the crash may have said to the officer during the investigation. The accident report can even be used to refresh an officer's memory of the crash. But the actual document itself cannot be introduced into evidence, and the officer's opinion of who is at fault is also excluded. That's because the jury is charged with deciding fault based on all the facts presented. Please remember, your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will always respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. It's common for a potential client to ask, there are many great firms out there. What separates Hollis Wright from other law firms? My response is generally to talk about the strengths of our law firm in handling cases throughout Alabama and the United States. That we've recovered through verdicts and settlements, hundreds of millions of dollars for our clients. That we have financial resources to hire any required expert and to take their case all the way to trial, even if it costs us hundreds of thousands of dollars to do so. 
that we handle cases only on a contingency fee, which means we never ask the client to pay any cost of litigation whatsoever and only recover those costs and fee if we win for the client. That we have a staff of more than 20 employees that help us litigate cases from start to finish. That we've had a television show on NBC 13 for six years that answers thousands of questions to citizens for free each year. But what I've learned in the last 20 years as a trial lawyer is that clients want more and deserve more than all those things. Those things are expected of each law firm they consider. So with that wisdom, what I tell clients now is simply this. We are a family-oriented practice at Hollis Wright, just like their own family. That we are a team-oriented group that engages in team-building exercises and team-building events because it helps our clients win cases. That we are dads and moms and brothers and sisters. That we are former Alabama trial lawyer presidents. That our bedside manner is second to none. So what really separates our firm from others? We're balanced and well-rounded, and as such, we relate to people not just as lawyers, but as compassionate human beings. Human beings that know what it's like to face a day in court. We are advocates, we are compassionate, we are tireless. We are, simply put, Hollis Wright. Welcome back into the attorneys. A few minutes remaining. If you want to speak with an attorney standing by live right now, you're going to want to take advantage of that. Um, we're going to get to Miranda because that, that's interesting conversation. But just to kind of button up on, on what we were discussing, a couple of stories that are on the headlines now is a couple of star athletes, African-American star athletes, um, were at the scene, just happened to be at the scene. I think uh, both were, one was in Vegas and one was, I think, a concert where some sort of criminal activity broke out. Um, and as often happens, everybody kind of runs to get out of the way. Um, both of these individuals were uh, detained and, and even taken down by the police officers, asked for identity, that sort of thing. You, you talked about uh, kind of um, officers' ability to search you and search your vehicle. It, can you be stopped um, like, like they did in those two scenes? Is that allowable? Well, if. If a police officer has reasonable suspicion to believe that an individual has committed some kind of crime, the officer has a right to detain them briefly, mm -hmm. to find out more information, to f follow up with their investigation. There is a point in time, though, where the police officer either has to arrest you or let you go. So, yes, you can be briefly stopped. Now, there's a difference in my view of taking somebody down right. where you actually physically throw somebody to the ground mm -hmm. and do certain things, which I, I don't think is proper under any circumstances if it's somebody they're just trying to find out some more information about. Is it always good advice to be polite and, and, and kind of, you know, um, you know, kind of handle it well, do, do what you can to, to be a help and not a hindrance when dealing with police officers? I think it's more of de-escalate situations. Right. I mean, you've seen over the last yeah. few years how terrible situations have gone right. south very quickly. Yeah. So I, I, I do think providing information, mm -hmm. not doing any kind of furtive gestures, right. not doing anything. Okay. I mean, I tell that to my children. Yeah. So Just I think it's good them. advice. Well, I think it makes it easy for everybody. Yeah. All right, rapid fire. Sure. Uh, if you're not read your Miranda rights, uh, are you guaranteed to get off your uh, get off the charge? No. Okay. Uh, let's go to DUI, because sure. I do want to rapid fire on some DUI. Sure. Is it accurate that the DUI penalties have gotten more significant over the last four or five years? Absolutely, specifically including uh, interlock devices put on people's carts, but yes, they, the, it's got significantly tougher. If you have a blood alcohol concentration of 0.15 or above in your first offense, 0.15 on your first offense, um, are you almost guaranteed to, if you don't, you know, somehow play it down, are you almost guaranteed to have the interlock in your car? Yes. And, and explain the interlock real quickly. The interlock is a device that, that's placed in your car that you have to actually breathe into, and if it registers a certain alcohol content or any alcohol content, the car won't start, you can't drive it. Rapid fire still. We're going we're gonna to hit you on this. Because <laughs> I, like uh, I, I wanted to get into some of the that's DUI good. stuff because sure. I think that's important. Um, uh, should you or should you not blow, or is it a lot more complicated than that? No, I mean, it, every th I, I've never suggested anybody blow because I don't trust machines. I just don't. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean if you don't blow, you cannot be charged with a DUI. You still can be. And are there ways um, that you challenge those machines at trial? 
uh, through calibration, inability to um, uh, have it properly calibrated, those types of things? Absolutely. I mean, one of the first things we do, obviously, is file to determine maintenance records on those, whether or not it was calibrated correctly, or a variety of things that you can do or lawyers do to ensure that if, the if somebody does blow, that the machine was working properly at the time. If you're outside the state and you receive a DUI, does it work its way back to Alabama? You know, that's a good question, and I don't have the answer for that. I think it does. Uh, I'm sure it does if it, if it meets the statutory requirements. But, yeah, I, you know, you threw me on one. No, that's okay. It's okay. Because well, no, I, I, I wanted, don't do a ton of DUI work. Yeah, but, I mean, I wanted to do yeah. a little rapid fire because I know those are a lot of questions that we get consistently mm -hmm. when we do these shows um, related to that topic because it is a topic that's significant. And David, as you well know, you know, our firm gets involved a lot when there's a drunk driver involved, and a lot of times, you know, somebody's injured because of a drunk driver, and uh, we're sitting and waiting while the criminal prosecution is ongoing, criminally prosecuting that person for a DUI, and then we're handling the injury claim associated with that. So um, sometimes there is an interplay between the burden of the civil case and the criminal case right. and uh, allowing the criminal case to run its course so that we can proceed with our civil case. Yeah. Been a really interesting conversation. I think we've covered a lot of ground, um, but just uh, right around two minutes remaining, I want to give both of you gentlemen the opportunity just for a closing thought. And John, if you would, you go first, please. Well, I, I think that I appreciate getting the chance to be here again. It's, it's always great to be able to help inform people about their rights, uh, especially when they're brought into a situation where they're charged criminally or potentially mm -hmm. could be charged criminally. The, I guess the, my only thought is this. If you're concerned that you're going to be charged about something, get an attorney. Right. You cannot help yourself. The best help you can get is through the advice of a counsel. Yeah, good. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm glad we do these shows. I mean, we've never shied away from <laughs> controversial shows. And uh, not that uh, doing criminal work and, and DUI uh, work shows is controversial, but we like to take on tough topics. And there are people in the viewing audience that have criminal convictions, uh, need to learn about expungement, need to learn that they need a, a lawyer or counsel uh, if they find themselves in this unfortunate circumstance. And there are also constitutional rights people have uh, where they have uh, been abused from a constitutional perspective where they need a guy like John to protect their interests right. uh, and make sure that they are properly handled in the criminal system. So. Um, getting a lawyer uh, and being educated about what your rights are and what you do and don't need to do uh, at a scene of an accident, those types of things are all the reason why we do this show. Right. Um, and uh, hopefully it's been helpful to uh, folks in the audience. I believe it has. Appreciate both of you being with us. Thanks thank for you. being on, hey, Tom. Thank really you very much it. for having me, guys. An interesting conversation that I hope you have enjoyed it as well. We're always appreciative of you joining us each and every Sunday evening as we wrap things up here. A reminder, just a few minutes remaining, those attorneys will be uh, standing by live to take some calls. Also, find the firm on social media, on uh, Facebook, as well as Twitter. Don't forget that contest. Uh, like and share. Head to Facebook and find it there. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.